So this presentation is about brackish water reverse osmosis, which means we first need to define brackish water. And this is a classification that falls between freshwater and seawater, but there is much more to it than that. Freshwater is any water with less than 1,000 milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids. Therefore, brackish water falls between 1,000 milligrams per liter and about 25,000 milligrams per liter of TDS. Some sources that have technically fresh water, that is less than 1,000 ppm, may still require RO treatment and may still be referred to as brackish water RO projects that use brackish water membranes, just as a, a shorthand. Composition of brackish water depends on its source characteristics. That includes local geology, hydrology, and sources of pollution or runoff. Despite these variations, most of the dissolved solids in brackish water consist of the cations magnesium, calcium, that is hardness, sodium, and potassium. The major anions are bicarbonate, carbonate, that is alkalinity, sulfate, and chloride. Obtaining as much information about the composition of the feedwater may be the most important step in brackish water RO design, as it sets the limits of what the system can accomplish. Well water is very commonly treated with brackish water RO, or BWRO, since it often has very high TDS and in some cases, it can be impacted by seawater intrusion, which further elevates that TDS. Well, water typically has the lowest organic content and fouling potential of the brackish water types. So well systems are designed with a relatively high average flux and recovery. Region and geology have a big impact on the treatment goals since wells can be affected by both natural and anthropogenic factors. The major treatment concerns when we uh, so setting our limitations and seeing what we want to prevent in the design process are uh, scaling and iron fouling. Surface water comes from lakes, rivers, reservoirs, and estuaries. Typically, it has lower TDS and higher total organic carbon and suspended solids when compared to well water. Its fouling potential is higher, so careful attention has to be paid to pretreatment in surface water applications. Biofouling and colloidal, that is suspended solids fouling, are the primary treatment issues, although issues like scaling and iron fouling are still possible. Wastewater is a challenging source to treat as it can have very high TDS and organic content, making flux balance and quality pretreatment essential. Membrane pretreatment allows us to be a little more aggressive with our design, but every treatment issue that's present in well water and surface water is also present in wastewater to a greater extent. As I mentioned earlier, many water sources have TDS that would qualify them as fresh water, but their applications demand higher quality permeate. Ultra pure water applications are focused on energy and water efficiency, as well as total conductivity elimination, often for a very low tolerance manufacturing process like microprocessors. Runoff or waste from mining processes can have variable TDS content, but often has high concentrations of toxic ions, which can be most effectively managed with RO treatment. Steam boilers using municipal water may require a higher degree of purity in order to prevent mineral scale from forming on fins, tubes, and turbine blades, which can lead to a loss of efficiency. Fouling is the primary concern in RO systems. 
and is inevitable to a certain extent, since total elimination of the above foulants is not possible. Each contaminant can be partially removed with pretreatment, and fouling tendency can be managed with proper system design. Even systems that have been fouled or scaled can have performance restored through cleanings, but a certain amount of irreversible flow loss is expected. Colloidal fouling happens when suspended solids are deposited on the membrane surfaces. Organic fouling can be due to a number of contaminants, both man-made and natural, and can act in combination with biofoulants. Microbial growth combined with extracellular excretions and organic balance can cause persistent biofilm production. Scaling occurs when mineral salts in saturation are deposited on the membrane surface. At the bottom, we can see typical values of flow loss and salt passage increase for various water sources from our Q plus projection software. These are uh, percentages that are applied year over year in order to forecast the membrane performance uh, as the membrane ages. The treatment strategies listed here can help mitigate the risks of different types of membrane fouling. When designing a system, advanced pretreatment can be a pretense for us to use a more aggressive design. For instance, if a surface water source has ultrafiltration for pretreatment, an engineer can assume a lower silt density index to the membrane and design with a higher recovery and average flux. However, more conventional pretreatment uses coagulation, flocculation, and filtration, that is media filtration, which is most effective for colloidal phalans but less useful for biofoulants. In such a case, oxidizing biocides may need to be used with sodium metabisulfite or ultraviolet to neutralize those oxidants ahead of the membrane. Scaling prevention is largely accomplished by acid and anti-scalant dosing to keep minerals in solution so that they can be rejected with the concentrate stream. Determining the proper system size depends on a few parameters, which may be predetermined by an end user or implemented in the design process. Average flux, which we set based on our water type, is defined as the permeate flow divided by the total membrane area, and it's expressed in LMH or GFD. We can use this value to determine the number of elements after selecting whether we want 400 or 440 square foot elements. The number of vessels, finally, equals the number of elements divided by the number of elements per vessel. This can be predetermined by the end user or recommended as a part of the design process. There's much more flexibility in pressure vessel length in brackish water than in seawater RO. Depending on the size of the system, the footprint available, and the desired recovery, it may be optimal to use a shorter pressure vessel. In low flux, high recovery systems, oftentimes there is insufficient concentrate flow to the tail element or insufficient net driving pressure to produce permeate. In such a system, it can be better to use lower membrane recovery combined with partial concentrate recirculation to increase recovery. It can also be necessary in smaller systems to use four inch elements instead of eight inch if the desired recovery is high. This is because smaller elements allow for longer pressure vessels over the same surface area, which will increase the potential recovery across that vessel. Multi-stage systems are better suited for brackish water RO than seawater, since the salinity in the second and third stages of a multi-stage system is so much higher than the first stage feed. 
More stages tend to enable higher recovery, especially in scenarios where short 2M or 3M vessels are required. That's two membranes or three membranes per vessel. Typically, stages exist in a ratio of pressure vessels as pictured in, in the table. The first stage treats the most water, so it has the most vessels and so on. A higher ratio of stage one to stages two and three can be necessary in systems with a higher fouling potential. The recovery that is possible in a system always depends on water quality. So simply having three stages in a system does not guarantee 95% recovery, but it is possible in specialized cases, especially with advanced pretreatment. Extreme temperature, high salinity, and variable production can cause flux imbalance, which results in high flux in the lead element or elements in a stage. This can lead to increased fouling tendency. In a multi-stage system, flux can be balanced using permeate throttling and interstage boost. At very high temperatures, high flux in the lead element can sometimes be unavoidable, but we can use these strategies as well as the proper ratio of pressure vessels between stages to mitigate the worst effects of flow imbalance. It's important to design for the worst case when it comes to feed pressure and permeate quality. Your highest feed pressure, worst case, will come at the highest age, highest salinity, lowest temperature, and your highest recovery if the plant has a fixed feed flow. This is because in a fixed feed flow, a higher recovery will lead to a higher permeate flow, and therefore a higher flux. Worst case permeate quality will come at highest salinity, highest age, highest temperature, and lowest recovery if the feed flow is fixed. Lower flux tends to lead to uh, lower salt rejection, whereas higher flux tends to lead to higher salt rejection and also higher pressure. If the plant has fixed permeate flow and variable recovery, these rules sometimes hold true, but not always. Systems requiring very low TDS permeate may require two passes. In brackish water applications, two pass systems are most commonly used to treat water from seawater impacted wells or in ultra pure applications. Two pass brackish systems can typically produce very high purity water with excellent recovery due to the lower system salinity as compared to seawater RO. In a two-pass system, one of the most intuitive modifications to be added is second-pass brine recirculation. Because the reject from the second pass has lower salinity than the first-pass feed, it dilutes the first-pass feed, reducing feed pressure and increasing system recovery. This method effectively brings the recovery of the second pass to 100%. As feed TDS increases, the benefits of second-pass brine recirculation increase but even in low TDS systems, the water savings are desirable. First pass brine recirculation is an effective way to increase recovery in systems with a limited footprint. By recycling a portion of the concentrate stream into the feed, the feed TDS increases but the overall system recovery improves due to the reduction in required raw water and the reduction in concentrate put to drain. Drawbacks from this technique include increased feed pressure and permeate TDS, and those issues scale upward with the proportion of concentrate recycled and with the TDS of the raw water. Chemical dosing in brackish water RO serves multiple functions. Acid dosing can increase solubility of ammonium for removal and keep scale forming salts in saturation from precipitating onto the membrane surface. 
ACE dosing converts carbon dioxide into other forms of alkalinity, which can be removed by the RO membrane to increase overall conductivity. In more specialized systems, pH can be controlled above 9 and below 7 to increase silica solubility. Those techniques are typically used in combination with a specialized scale inhibitor in systems where there is a scale forming tendency. On this slide, we can see the specifications for the full suite of LG Chem brackish water RO membranes. Our high and superior rejection elements come in standard, fouling resistant, and chemical resistant varieties. And our low and ultra low energy elements are suitable for applications where reduced feed pressure is critical. For high stress applications where fouling tendency is elevated, our AFR element is manufactured with a coating to reduce adherence of foulants to the membrane surface. All of our 400 square foot elements are available with a low DP spacer, which utilizes lower turbulence to decrease pressure drop across each element. This reduces the fouling tendency and overall stress on the system. Within our Q-Plus software is a set of RO design guidelines where a user can select their units, metric or American, and drill down by water type to determine our recommended range of average flux, system recovery, and expected feed water parameters. This file is a useful jumping off point when beginning the design process. Each water profile is unique and requires iteration to determine an optimal design, but we recommend starting here when using Q+, especially if you're new to the software. When we move into our design exercises on the next slide, I will be referencing this slide fairly often so we can get an idea of how to use it during the design process.